If you're like me, the butterfly dreams start around Thanksgiving and grow more vivid as the winter progresses. By February, I'll have spent several nights finding never-reported species lurking in the strangest landscapes, each time waking up with a feeling of loss and yearning. By March, I'm so ready to see a butterfly that I start searching my yard whenever the temperature tops 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I've learned, though, that few butterflies are willing to break diapause to end my butterfly drought. Usually, I won't see my first Compton tortoiseshell, spring azure, or morning cloak until early April. Unless you're like Robert Michael Pyle and are willing to wheedle the swangles into taking you winter butterflying in search of pupae or larvae, you're likely to find yourself with a little time on your hands. Here are some ways to keep yourself busy and prepare for those warmer butterfly months. I've pieced together a reading list of books I'm glad I read, starting with that same Robert Michael Pyle writing about his big butterfly year in Mariposa Road. Kerouac meets Darwin in this arresting classic, Pyle tromps around the United States with his ride, a charismatic Volvo named Powder Milk, trying to find as many butterfly species before the year runs out. His escapades will have you dreaming to travel to southern Arizona in the mountains, or possibly Florida and Georgia. Pyle might even help you shape future vacations. Pyle's written a slew of other books based around his lepidopter and interests. I've read many of them and recommend them for the high quality of his writing and the philosophical value of his thoughts. One of the founders of the Xerces Society, Pyle's done a lot of important butterfly work and offers many insights that will help you find more bugs. You can even find Pyle's coloring book of butterflies, a great way to examine butterfly patterning while keeping your hands occupied. Barbara Kingsolver's fictional Flight Behavior from 2012 tackles climate change and the ways different folks perceive it helping the reader understand why a terrible ecological crisis is viewed as a miracle by some. King Solver's keen grasp of biological issues, evident throughout her works, pushes her to examine the social and cultural responses to a drastic change in the overwintering of monarch butterflies. If you prefer nonfiction and you don't want to read your field guides again, you might consider one of the heavier reads like Butterflies, Ecology and Evolution Taking Flight, a collection of overview articles written by experts in topics from the ecology of butterfly vision to the biology of extinctions and populations. Edited by Carol Boggs, Ward Watt, and Paul Ehrlich, this volume from 2003 will provide more details than you might have thought possible about the ecology and behavior of butterflies. It's altered the way I think of butterflies when searching for them. Speaking of field guides, if you rely on yours, you might want to make tabs to help create a personally useful index. A few colored tabs in your favorite field guide are all you'll need to add quick tabs to find important information in the field. NABA and SWIBA also have useful indices available on their websites that will help you determine which species to mark. I'm not sure if they fit in the fiction or nonfiction category, but you might want to put some time aside to pour over seed catalogs, particularly for prairie plants that might invite some butterflies to the yard. I prefer the catalogs that suppress the hype and just tell me the conditions for growing and germinating. This year I enjoyed the unending flowering of a British roadside weed, Viper's Bug Loss, which proved a haven for bumblebees and monarchs. Seed is only available from a few stateside sources. Another possibility is volunteering some time with the prairie enthusiasts in gathering and processing seed. Check out their website for details on planned opportunities. Another activity to keep your mind working is learning the scientific names of your favorite butterflies. I recommend making a set of flashcards, adding five species each week. It's highly important that you say both scientific and common names aloud as your ear will add more valuable information for the brain to process and pronouncing scientific names help you hear the musicality of dead languages. You might add a translation from the Latin to help build knowledge of roots and commonly use epithets such as vulgar. Winter also might provide you time to catalog those thousands of digital images that have accrued over the months. I suggest sorting files by date and inserting a WordPad file with a quick description of the locations and other pertinent data that you might find in notes or may even remember. 
or explain that you forgot and leave a record for yourself and others to that shortcoming. You might find yourself checking banking records and gas receipts to recreate your travels. Digital cameras also record useful information for each file that you can find using a picture viewer or editor. If you haven't done so already, the cold months offer time to piece together a life list. I deploy a spreadsheet linking to a folder that has pictures of all the species I've photographed. One column lists the Wisconsin species and the other holds all other species. I note the date and location for each species. If you just want to relax while still using your brain, you can always spend the dark hours piecing together a 3,000 piece jigsaw of butterflies from around the world. None of us are immortal and winter offers a time to plan for our eventual demise. Do you have a plan for your photos and field notes? Would you bequeath your savings to the North American Butterfly Association? Winter allows us a time to slow down and plan for the coming year and reflect upon the past year. I hope you find that your winter non-butterflying times add to the quality of those warmer months.